Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Well, good morning, dear church, and welcome to worship. This is the third Sunday in Lent. I had to double check to make sure I had the correct Sunday. Perhaps you too have experienced a very speedy beginning of 2024. We give thanks to God that we can worship God together in community. And I'd like to offer a special welcome to those of you who are visiting with us and those of you who are joining us from your home, from your hospital room, from your home in the winter, and wherever you may be, somehow God makes us one. God makes us a community. Welcome to worship. Please rise as you are comfortable.
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, oops, excuse me, you may be seated. <laughs> People of God, we have a calling and a purpose. God calls us to do the work of 
celebrating God's grace in Jesus Christ, accepting all unconditionally, and growing in God's call to serve the world. This is who we are, and at the same time, this is who we strive to become. Sustained by God's mercy, we are called to follow Jesus and to serve our neighbor. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. It's children's time, so if the kids would meet me on the blue carpet, I'll see you there. Theo, would you do me a favor and hold that? Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll tell you when it's time to hold it up, okay? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Blessed by God today and every day. I was wondering if any of you recognize this. Yes, yes, you all do? Okay, great. Um, will you tell me what this is? The Ten Commandments. Anyone else in the room recognize these? Oh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's good. Okay, great, great. Okay, so these are from, I borrowed these from Mrs. Mack's classroom, and it's the Ten Commandments, and they're on felt, you know, and felt sticks to felt, which is really cool. And uh, that's, I wanted us to have the Ten Commandments today because we are going to hear from Exodus the Ten Commandments, which is when, do you know anything about the Ten Commandments? I want to I ask you first before I tell you. Anything we should know about them at all? How many are there? Ten. Okay, yes. All right. Good, doing good so far. Moses and the Israelites were freed or escaped slavery in Egypt. And now they are going to have special ways to relate to each other. They're going to have the Ten Commandments to help them be in relationship with God and the community. And the first one, can somebody, well, do you know the first commandment? I'm curious. <laughs> yep. All right, we got it right here. You shall have no other gods. So, Theo, will you hold up this thing I gave you? All right. Uh, I made some adjustments to this foam finger. It, it has a G on it, but it stands for God, okay? <laughs> All right? I taped over some of the stuff. So we know that God is number one. Oh, yeah, you're taking the tape. No, the tape has to stay on. The tape stays on. God is number one. We just, like, have you ever been at a game where people are chanting things together? Okay, well, we are the church, and so we chant things together. Usually, it's praise to God and also prayers for our neighbors. So we're going to say God's number one a, a couple times, maybe like three times with everybody. Does that sound Okay. Okay, we're going to say God's number one, and Theo, you got to hold that up again. Okay, ready? God's number one. God's number one. God's number one. That's great. That's a great start to learning the Ten Commandments. It's for the people to have good relationships with God, who's number one in our lives, and God's creation, meaning all people. So we have the first commandment. Will you say that one again? You shall have no other gods. Do you know what the second commandment is? I think Mrs. Mac does. It's close. Here's a, here's a trick to remember. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. But the Sabbath day is the third one. That's good. If anybody has, you know what? I'm going to open it up to everybody. How many do we have? And can we get them in a row? Mrs. Mack doesn't get to sit, speak because she teaches these every day, every Sunday for 52 years. Okay, number four. Honor your father and mother. Number five. 
you, you shall not kill. Okay. Oh, yeah. God's number one. Okay. God's number one break. Okay. Number six. Not commit adultery. Number seven. You shall not steal. I'm hearing the answers. Okay. Number eight. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Oh, I'm seeing nods out there. Good job. We're right back in Sunday school. Number nine. There's only two more. Something with coveting. Okay, you should not covet your neighbor's house. Good job. This is the super long one about coveting. <laughs> neighbor's wife, maid servant, man servant, servant, cattle, or anything that is your neighbor. Good job. Okay, wow. That's just the beginning of what you might learn in Mrs. Mack's Sunday school class, or hopefully other places in church. Can we hold up the God's number one again? Let's say it together on three. One, two, three. God's number one. Great job, everyone. You can go sit down. I would like my foam finger back. Thanks. Actually, this belongs to my husband. It's not mine. A reading from Genesis. God spoke, oh, sorry, a reading from Exodus. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We will read Psalm 19 responsibly. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber, it rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the utmost edge of the heavens and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then I shall be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer.
The Gospel according to John, the second chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at the tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to Jesus, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, but will you raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Now, I strongly considered today to get a few card tables out and just, like, place them around the sanctuary and have people flip them at some point in the sermon where you weren't expecting it, but I decided that would be perhaps a little bit too scary for this morning. But you can imagine what it would be like if we were having worship together and all of a sudden a table was flipped and money was dumped on the ground... I don't think I even have to do it for real. You can just imagine what kind of disruption this would be. And Jesus does this in every single gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have different accounts of Jesus cleansing the temple, as you might know it. And I don't know if you've ever been at a worship service or experience where there's been a disruptive event of some sort that kind of jolts everybody out of whatever ritual it is that we're participating in. Wow, this is a strong story. The Gospel of John adds a few extra things. We have sheep and cattle. We have a whip of cords that Jesus makes. This isn't seen in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. Just John. And John is written the latest of all four Gospels. Mark is the earliest. Matthew and Luke are similar time frames. And then John might be written even between the year 90 and 100 current era. Remember, Jesus died in the 30s and was raised to new life. So we have 60 to 70 years in between the death and resurrection of Jesus and when the Johannine community is contending with what it means to be who they are and who God is and who Jesus is. And so this community writes very differently about Jesus compared to the synoptic gospels. The synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So we're in heavy Bible study territory right now. But you can do it. We need this. Otherwise, we just have Jesus with a whip of cords, and what's that about? Have you ever been in a situation of worship that is disrupted, that takes you out of what you think you're supposed to be doing? And I'm not talking about noisy kids in the pew. We love noisy kids in the pew. I might have been one. You might have too. I studied abroad when I was 21 years old. I was in the Dominican Republic. I went to a Catholic church with my host family once in a while. I didn't always know what was happening because one, I didn't grow up Catholic, and two, my Spanish was pretty good, but not good enough to follow every single thing that was going on. But right after the worship service was done, the minute that the, what is it called, the postlude ended, There would be children that would come in from outside and start making their way around the pews, holding out their hands, saying, Dame algo. Dame algo. If you don't know what that means, it means give me something. 
Because these children were sent by whatever person was going to collect all the money that they got out in the community begging. Do you know what I'm saying? These children were sent out to churches to get money from people. Now, they might have lived in poverty. These kids might have actually needed help. Most likely they did. So the minute we were done hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, after everybody had received communion, I didn't because I respected the Catholic Church's rules and I did not go up for communion and I was okay with that. But the minute after the worship service ended, all of a sudden, the world's pain showed up in front of your face with these kids who are begging for money. And I, being a, honestly a kid, was just trying to understand how we left Jesus outside the building while we were having worship inside. Because the face of Jesus showed up in front of me and said, give me something. And I'm a 21-year-old. I have a couple pesos in my pocket, but that is not going to disrupt the systemic injustice that causes people to send children to beg people for money and then take that money for themselves because poverty was all over. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not just about the kids asking for money after the worship service is done. It is about the structural injustices that cause that to be an option. And I wanted to save everybody and everything, but I didn't know what to do because I was just there for four months, and what am I going to do? I don't understand this country. I barely understand the language. I don't understand the climate. I don't understand the culture. And I just want to make sure these kids are okay. That experience reshaped my understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. We can sit in the pews and be very comfortable or uncomfortable, depending on if you need a cushion or not for your back. (laughs) But I understand why people do show up to a worship service, why they might be so exhausted, why they might be somebody who needs help and community and connection, why they might be searching for peace and comfort, and maybe just a calm time to be in presence of community and God, that is a good and worthy thing and a reason that we exist as the church to provide that space. But then we have gospel stories like this, when Jesus shows up and disrupts the entire structure for the sake of bringing a more just world to everybody. So those kids don't have to go from person to person in the pews and say, dame algo. Jesus disrupts the temple worship, and the people are like, give us a sign for why you're doing this. Because this Jesus guy has no authority. He has no authority in the temple structure. He is an observant Jewish man. So he, like many Jews, goes to the temple to participate in worship. This is a faithful thing. And then he, some random person who walks into the temple, starts throwing tables. And it's not just in a little corner. It is in the midst of the public arena during a high feast day when a lot of people would be coming to this place Jesus disrupts the whole system. And it's not because we're trying to say that Christianity is better than Judaism. That's not the point of these stories. The point of these stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is to show that the locus, the center of God's presence in the world is in Jesus. Because by the time the Gospel of John is written, the temple has been decimated for a good 20 to 30 years. And the traumatized community is trying to figure out what it means to be the people of God now. 
What does it mean to be the people of God now who have suffered another decimation of the center of their religious life? Because the temple's been destroyed before. So in the Gospel of John, we have a community who is considering the identity of Jesus as the center of God's presence. Because they need a powerful savior. They need someone to remind them who they are and what they're supposed to be about in the world. You know what other stories show up in the Gospel of John that don't show up in the other Gospels? Because we have to read them alongside this Jesus who is zealous for the Lord's house, which is a quote from Zechariah, I believe. The Gospel of John is so different and offers us a lens through which to understand the God of life in Jesus. Jesus says in the Gospel of John and not in the other Gospels that I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And so Jesus will be taking down every structure and system that is preventing people from having abundant life. Now, some of us are comfortable with the structures and the systems, and we're doing just fine, thanks very much, so I'd rather not have my whole world rocked today. But some people have been waiting for freedom for so long. And they have been prevented from even being fully human in this life. So a Jesus who disrupts even the center of everything is a really hopeful figure for those people, for me and for you. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Another story in the Gospel of John that you don't see in other Gospels is when Jesus, the servant Christ, removes his robe, puts on a towel, kneels at the feet of the disciples, and starts washing their feet and says, Love one another as I have loved you. Just as I have loved you, so you should love one another. Also in the Gospel of John, you don't see this in the other Gospels when it's Time for Jesus to be arrested. Do you know what happens? The soldiers show up and they say, where is he? And Jesus says, I am he. And the soldiers fall down. That happens two times. This is a powerful Jesus. When he's on the cross, what are his last words? In the Synoptic Gospels, it's, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At least in Mark and Matthew and Luke, it's, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In John, do you know what Jesus says? It is finished. Bows his head, gives up his life. Powerful Jesus for powerless people to disrupt the systems that render them powerless so that they can access abundant life, not just in some faraway heaven, but now on earth. Now. This isn't just a story of Jesus being angry. It's the presence of God among us for the sake of the ones who have been cast aside, cast out, even left for dead. The power of God in Jesus Christ is at work in the world, removing every barrier that prevents people from really living now. Where in the world are people prevented from living now? This weekend, I got two phone calls. Non-members, but people who know that Emmanuel is a place to call if they need help. 
One was someone who said, I've never been in this situation before and I'm homeless. I am now going to be homeless. Said, okay, here's what I can do. I can give you these numbers and you can come back to the church on Monday morning. That's a little teeny thing in the face of a big problem. The other phone call was a family from another community looking for resources to help them pay their rent because there isn't work right now for them and they're trying so hard to be able to make the bills. Our neighbors in need are not far. Will we be as bold as the God of life in Jesus Christ working to disrupt the systems that keep people small. And if you don't know where to start, start here with each other. Now. You have been called as God's living church, the living body of Christ in the world. So when you share the peace today, and when you come up for communion today, and when you leave this building today, you leave in the same spirit that Jesus had, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same spirit that works to dismantle every oppressive system that is harming creation and our neighbors and us. So if you would be so bold, would you turn to your neighbor this morning and would you please offer a blessing? Just a simple blessing. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are God's. In the name of Jesus, you belong to the God of life. That's the blessing. In the name of Jesus, you belong to the God of life. Will you share that, please? You belong to the God of life. Thank you. All right, we started. Here's the start. Here's the start. Thank you for indulging me. We didn't turn any tables this morning, but call me if you do. So I'd like to I'd like to learn about it. May the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
confess our faith together. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. We pray for your church. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken us to the mystery of your presence and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of your deliverance. And we pray for your creation. Drive out those who would make the earth a marketplace. Protect rainforests, mountaintops, oceans, and wilderness areas from commercial exploitation. Unite nations, policymakers, and businesses in efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Almighty God, to you all desires are known. We pray for the nations of the world. May there be an end to war and strife in every land, especially Palestine and Israel and Ukraine and Russia. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing from conflict. And we pray for the healing and wholeness of all. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, and public health workers to, who prevent and treat illness. We pray for any who are sick. Almighty God, from you no secrets are hid. We pray for those in any need. Sustain all in this community undergoing life's transitions. Marriage, divorce, childbirth, adoption, moving, graduation, employment change, or a death in the family. And we remember our loved ones who have died, confident that they have new life <coughs> in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your love. us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share words and signs of Christ's peace. As we continue sharing the peace, I will share a few announcements with you this morning. You might have gotten your new Life with the Manual mini newsletter. Please note that there is an insert about Holy Week and Easter. This is meant to be shared with a friend or someone who you would like to invite to church. So please share the insert that is found in your Life with the Manual, including our Holy Week and Easter worship times. Please note that this morning we do have our first of three Sundays of our Reconciling in Christ Bible study. That is happening in the conference room in the education wing, which is on the first floor. Wednesdays in Lent, we continue gathering for a Lent lunch at noon and evening worship at 6.30. Lent lunch is a time to share soup along with scripture, prayer, and guided conversation. And our evening worship service includes the same scripture and prayers along with beautiful music. It also features panel conversations that pair with the day's focus. This Wednesday, our theme will focus around our baptismal promise to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed. Our panel will be made up of some Sunday school and confirmation leaders here at Emmanuel. Also, please note that this Sunday and next Sunday, puffins are for sale, which benefit the two youth that are going to the ELCA Youth Gathering this summer in New Orleans. You can also order online or call the office. And don't forget that our Sunday school has challenged the congregation in their penny challenge for the season of Lent to benefit the ELCA Good Gifts program. The containers and more information are in the narthex. We will be gathering at the table where we are reminded who we are, where we are filled with every good thing that God has for us, God's very self. You'll be released into the center aisle, come up front, hold out your hands to receive a wafer, then take a small cup from the silver tray that's filled with dealkalized wine. We also have gluten-free wafers if you need those. Your cups can be placed in the baskets by the pillars, and you may return to your pew by the side aisle. If you'd like us to bring communion in the pew, let the usher know, and we will meet you there. This is the meal where we are made one with Christ and one with each other.
Please rise as you feel comfortable. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy life is the kingdom. The power, the power and the glory, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come, you may be seated.
Please rise as you feel comfortable. Let us pray. <coughs> Generous God, as this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Beloved, we are God's people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you, shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Peace, say your bad. Thanks be to God.